I just watched a video of a flea under a microscope and all that appears are labels like pronotal comb or plantar bristle. But what actually are these structures? What's their function and why are they there? Fleas belong to the order Siphonaptera and are small wingless insects. All of them are obligate blood feeders with both sexes feeding exclusively on blood. Within this order there are roughly 2,500 described species of flea 95% of these flea species feed on mammals, while the other 5% parasitise birds. The diversity of fleas is linked to the fact that they are quite host-specific. While fleas can feed from animals aside from their preferred host, as in the famous case of rat fleas biting humans and spreading bubonic plague, they tend to stick to a few species, although there are some notable exceptions in the literature, for example a 2004 report of human infestation by pigeon fleas. But in general we have a species of flea for humans, one for bradges and a branch of rodent fleas. What we're going to look at today is often called the common flea, which is Tenocephalides canis, or the dog flea. What you're looking at here is a female Tenocephalides canis, which tend to be larger than males. So what I really want to do today is run through the main anatomical features that we can see on the flea under the microscope, starting with number one, general anatomy. Overall, the flea has a laterally compressed body, meaning that it's thin when you look at it from head on. Their slender bodies are adapted to enable them to slip between the hairs of their host as easily as possible. Like other insects, the flea has body segments roughly divided into the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The thorax consists of three segments, each with a pair of legs. These segments are called the prothorax, which is the first segment, the mesothorax in the middle, and the metathorax just before the abdomen. Number two, the eyes. The eyes of the flea are present as dark, light-sensitive spots which are sufficient to detect changes in light intensity which might represent the shadow of a host passing by. It's thought that these were once compound eyes but have since regressed over time to become hardened, mainly because of the effect of host hair brushing up against compound eyes and damaging them. Number three, the tinnidia. These are the pronotal and genal combs. Each of these spines is referred to as a tinnidium and give the dog its taxonomic name of Tenocephalides canis. Tina referring to the tinnidium, cephal referring to the head, and canis to its preferred host. Their function has been the subject of some debate. D. A. Humphreys wrote to Nature in 1967 to inform the world that the spacing of spines in the combs of fleas bears a close relationship to the diameter of the hairs of the appropriate host. The gap between the tips of the spines is usually about 1.75 times greater than the average diameter of the host's hairs. Humphreys concluded that the combs acted to prevent fleas from being dislodged from their host by catching on the hairs. However, A.G. Marshall disagreed and presented a paper to the International Conference on Fleas in 1977, arguing against Humphrey's theory after spending presumably a lot of time observing West Malaysian bat fleas, both living and dead. Marshall states that actually the function of the combs is to protect mobile joints of the flea against the abrasive action of host hairs. Marshall makes a very compelling argument and a link to the paper is in the video description. Number four. The secretory pores. At this level of magnification, if we zoom in and out, it's like taking a cross-section at different levels of the flea's head. One structure you can appreciate here are what look like little holes in the flea. These are pores and they're there for a good reason. They're the openings to glands that secrete an oily substance which coats the flea's head. This greases up the flea and makes it easier for it to move between the host's hairs. Additionally, Humphreys, the very same one who measured the distances between tinnidia, found that some element of this oily substance acts to stimulate male fleas to initiate a sexual response to females. Number five, the feeding apparatus. At the front of the head, there are the mouth parts. They're not particularly well preserved on this specimen and they're far better seen with an electron microscope. Perhaps we can leave discussing the structure of these mouth parts for another video. Moving backwards, we can see the pharynx and esophagus, which take blood from the mouth parts down to the digestive system. Number six, the sensory organs of the head. The flea has two pairs of sensory organs on its head. 
The most foremost are the maxillary palps, which are right next to the feeding apparatus. The other pair are the flea's antenna, which are tucked behind the eye in grooves to protect them from the host's hair. Unlike other insects, the antennae are not long and wavy, but short and club-like. The antennae remain in that position, except during the flea's jump, during which they project out from the head. Number seven, the structure of the prothorax. Moving backwards, we can reach the flea's thorax. You'll notice that the back edge of each segment overlies the front edge of the next one. This allows the segments to squeeze over one another and gives the flea a little bit more mobility. Most winged insects have a joined meso- and metathorax called a pterothorax, but fleas have a separate meso- and metathorax which gives them a higher degree of mobility. The structure of the prothorax in fleas is very different to other insects. First of all, the prothorax is divided into three sections, the pronotum at the top, the propleuron in the middle, and the prosternum at the bottom. The prosternum is elongated in the flea and extends forward to envelop the rear part of the head. As a result, the first pair of legs is situated very close to the head. This gives the front end of the flea a keel shape, almost like a boat which is designed to part the water in front of it. In the same way, the front end of a flea will part hairs, allowing the rest of the flea to slip between them. Number 8. The structures of the legs. Along the length of the legs we can see hairs. These are called ceta, which are found in many insect species. The purpose of the bristles is varied. Again, some of them will be acting as guards to keep host hair from brushing against the flea. Smaller bristles will have a sensory function and allow the flea to feel what's going on around it. And of course, some might even play a role in allowing the flea to stick to its host through the various trials such as grooming and moving about. At this magnification, we can also see that there are wavy structures within the flea's leg. These are the flea's muscles, called striated muscle because of the lines. At the end of each leg are hooks called tarsal claws, which are certainly helpful in helping the flea stick to its host. Number nine, the jumping apparatus. At this low power view, you can see that the hind legs of the flea are the longest. These legs hold the secret to the flea's jumping ability, but it's not because they're particularly muscly or strong, but because of something much more subtle. The hind leg is composed of several segments, starting with the first part attached to the metathorax, we have the coxa. This is attached to the femur by a smaller plate called the trochanter. The femur is attached to the tibia, and the tibia is attached to the tarsus, composed of five segments ending in the tarsal claw. The jumping mechanism of the flea wasn't worked out until relatively recently, in 1975, when a team of scientists led by Miriam Rothschild came up with an idea of how to photograph a flea jumping. They took advantage of a flea's natural tendency to climb to the highest point closest to them and jump off the top. By placing a perspex pyramid in a flea enclosure and focusing a high-speed camera on the summit, they were able to take detailed photos of fleas as they queued up to jump off the top. Their results are published in a great paper in another review, which I'll leave links to in the video description. Here's a schematic of what they found. First the flea collects its legs under itself and crouches down. The hind leg is pressed against the ground in preparation for the jump. Notice the hind leg has two points of contact, the long spindly part of the leg called the tibia and the joint called the trochanter. The flea releases a huge amount of energy from its hind legs, forcing the trochanter against the ground. As the trochanter recoils and lifts off the floor, the femur rotates to keep the tibia in contact with the floor to produce more thrust until the flea is airborne. But where is all this energy coming from? I'll show you something that looks quite unremarkable. This is the pleural arch, and it contains the material that powers the flea's jump. This material is a protein called resilin. Resilin is like rubber. It can store and transfer energy, but far more efficiently than the rubber we use. When stretched, it yields back 97% of stored energy, with the remaining 3% lost as heat. Compare that to commercial rubber, which loses 15% of stored energy as heat. It's so efficient that resilin can be stretched to three times its length for several months, and when released it will return to its original size. Other insects, such as dragonflies and locusts, also have resilin in their pleural arch, but rather than using it for jumping, they use it for flying. In fact, it's likely that the flea's jumping apparatus is derived from the wing system of some previously winged ancestor. 
When fleas cock their legs before jumping, they compress the resilin, which stores the energy from the movement of the leg muscles. When released, all of that energy is transferred down the leg and drives against the ground, launching the flea. It will surprise many people that not all fleas are good jumpers. A good example of this are mole fleas and bat fleas. Bat fleas hatch in the bat poo lining covering cave floors before crawling up the walls to find a host. Jumping has no benefit for them since they're spending their lives on the hosts that they find. Indeed, jumping off a flying host would probably not be such a good survival strategy. In species of flea with poor jumping ability, the pleural arch has reduced amounts of resilience, or it can be completely absent. Number 10. The spiracles. These openings in the side of the flea are called spiracles and are the entrance to the flea's respiratory system. You can see the tubes branching off to deliver oxygen and remove carbon dioxide. The flea can control the sides of the openings using muscles, but there's no equivalent to the lungs or gills as in higher organisms. Instead, the flea has to rely on diffusion to deliver gases, which isn't a problem because of their small size. Number 11. The pygidial plates. The most obvious structure on the abdomen is this part called the pygidium or the sensilium. It's another sensory organ which allows the flea to detect the movement of air around it, helping it to decide when a host is nearby. Number 12, the seminal receptacle. This particular flea we're looking at is a female, so we should be able to find a seminal receptacle, or spermatheca, in the form of an outpocketing of the lower part of the female tract, or as an invagination of the body near the gonopore. That's all I've got to say about fleas for now. I hope you enjoyed the video now that you're all informed and able to wow your friends and family with your absolutely useless knowledge about why fleas have spines on their heads. Until next time, goodbye.